الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد الشاكرين المعترفين بنعمائه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته وسره لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة لنا إلا بك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صلي وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endlessly is in his glory the creator of heavens and earth the provider, the cherisher, the sustainer, the bestower of bounties I thank the Lord Almighty for the blessings that he has granted me and my family and loved ones I express my gratitude to the Lord in words and action I say alhamdulillah for blessings I know and blessings I know not for bounties I'm aware of and bounties that are hidden from my eyes. <coughs> I bear witness that there's no deity in this universe worthy of worship save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger. The bearer of glad tidings, the role model to be followed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon the prophet and his family, his descendants, his companions and followers and all the righteous men and women that walk in their footsteps. And I ask Allah to make each and every one of us among them. Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with a greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the most remarkable stories uh, ever told is the story of Prophet Yusuf, you know, Joseph in the biblical tradition. Uh, Yusuf alayhi salam um, had such a tremendous story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dedicated an entire surah, an entire chapter in the Qur'an that is named after him, Surah Yusuf, one of the beautiful surahs that we love to recite and we love to memorize. Uh, and this particular chapter of the Qur'an, uh, you know, tells you the story of all the avalanches of events and the tumult of emotions that took place, that defined the life of Prophet Joseph, Yusuf alayhi salam, uh, from being the favored son of his parents, uh, to basically being on the brink of death in a pit hole. Uh, and then he is picked up by this caravan and becomes a slave and suffers a little bit. And then he's sold to an extremely powerful man of Egypt. And then ba basically he becomes his uh, closest advisor and he becomes really prominent and loved and respected. And then he goes to prison and spends, you know, some scholars said, you know, about seven years. Um, and again, he reaches a certain level of despair and, and then he is released from prison and he becomes an extremely prominent minister of Egypt himself and he saves an entire country from famine. You almost see the story of human life reflect itself in this narrative, you know, the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows, uh, the moments of peace and prosperity and the moments of pain and adversity. But what I noticed in the story of Yusuf السلام, is also something really fascinating. And that is, before any triumph that Yusuf experienced, it was always preceded by an extremely bleak moment of adversity. If you notice the narrative, every time Yusuf السلام, is up there, that moment is always preceded by severe trials and tribulations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that pushed him to the brink of despair. And that is when God interferes with his own power and his own might and his own grace. I mean, pay attention to the story, right? Uh, Yusuf alayhi salam in, in that uh, abandoned pit hole, it's not even used as a water well anymore, so nobody uses it. No one comes to that area, and that is why, you know, his brothers threw him in there. So he's by himself, you know, in that darkness, and he literally gave up hope, and he realized that he was just stabbed in the back by his own brothers, his own flesh and blood, who, you know, left him for dead, basically. And, and he is literally on the brink of losing hope, what's completely. And then what happens after? He becomes, an, uh, you know, a, a close advisor and he starts serving in the house of a very powerful man uh, in Egypt, right? Uh, that, uh, that the Quran call, calls Aziz al-Misr. 
you know, the prominent man of Egypt. And then his life takes a completely different turn. But that turn was preceded by that moment when the trials and the tribulations accumulated over each other and left him no room for any more hope. And the same thing happened later in his life. When he goes, in, in, when he goes to jail and he languishes there for so many years and all hope is, is, runs out completely. He even asks one man that was about to be released and as the Quran says, أذكرني عند ربك Remember to mention my name in the presence of your master because I am innocent. And the man completely forgot to mention Yusuf's name you know, when he was released and Yusuf languished in prison for years, right? And again, the same thing, trials and tribulations. He knows that he's innocent, that he's being wrongfully accused, that he's, you know, languishing in the darkness of prison, not because of a fault of his own, but because of a woman that seduced him and she plotted this whole thing in order to cover up for what she did. And when things hit rock bottom for Yusuf alayhi salam, what happens? The most unexpected thing. The king sees a dream or a vision. And every, uh, you know, wizard and every wise man and every priest fails to give them a proper interpretation of the dream. So they go looking and looking and looking until finally someone says, oh my goodness, there's this guy in prison who knows how to interpret dreams. And from being a prisoner that could have stayed there forever, Yusuf alayhi salam becomes a minister, becomes wealthy and powerful. And the same thing happened later in his life, subhanAllah. Yusuf alayhi salam gets married and he had a family. But the thought that he would never see his parents and his family again always overwhelmed his mind. And the scholars said that Yusuf prayed and prayed and prayed to be able to see his own family. You know, his father, Yaqub alayhi salam. And when he reached a moment of despair and he felt in his heart that there is no way I'm going to see my family ever again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his family to him. And his brothers come. And then his younger brother Benjamin comes. And then his parents come and he sees the fulfillment of his dream happening and unfolding before his own eyes. Now the fascinating thing is that at the end of Surah Yusuf, those of you who know the Surah, at the end of Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something really fascinating. It is almost like the Lord coins this understanding in eternal Quranic wisdom. Right? There are the examples and the stories, but then we need to put it in, in one statement that we can live by. حَتَّى إِذَا اسْتَيْأَسُ الرُّسُلُ وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا جَاءَهُمْ نَصْرُنَا فَنُجِّيَ مَنْ نَشَاء the Lord, the Lord says here that when messengers, you know the messenger of God, we're not talking about ordinary people, we're talking about the messengers of God. When messengers, as a result of trials and tribulations, they reach severe despair, اسْتَيْأَسَ الرُّسُلُ They reach severe despair, and they think that their followers would walk out on them and abandon them because of how severe the trials and tribulations are. It is at that moment and only at that moment that the Lord interferes with His grace and His might and power. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حَتَّى إِذَا اسْتَيْأَسَ الرُّسُلُ وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِّبُوا جَاءَهُمْ نَصْرُونَ Our victory comes to them at that moment. And again, I know that it is easy to be dismissive of these notions in the scriptures thinking that, yes, this happens to prophets and this happens to messengers and happens to great people, you know, in the Qur'an. But, you know, we're Muslims that live in America, 2019. It's, how does that apply to us? And the point is, I want every single one of you to just look back at your own life and, and just do a little investigative analysis. Take a harder look. And every single one of you will realize that there was not one moment, but multiple moments and junctures in your life where you reached that, you hit that rock bottom. And you reached that severe moment of despair and you've tried everything. And you've knocked on every door and you've consulted with everyone and you've literally every last trick in your sack you've used and exploited and still no relief. And out of nowhere, in the most unpredictable fashion, God interferes and He relieves your situation. It is almost like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell you and inform you and keep you updated of who ultimately is in control. 
We think that with our money and wealth and with our status and with our education, with our intelligence, we'll be able to make things happen and get out of situations. You know, you've you got to keep trying. That's a given. You have to keep trying and you have to keep hustling and you have to keep striving. But at the end of the day, when things get really, really bleak and extremely, extremely difficult, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you who's boss at the end of the day. Who truly is in control. And we've seen that pattern, by the way. We've seen it in the story of Musa, alayhi salam, you know, Prophet Moses, when he was in the process of delivering the Israelites out of Egypt. You know, a lot of stories about Egypt. It's interesting. And, and, and he basically in the middle of the night, so he tries with Pharaoh so many times, you know, let my people go, let my people go, deliver the Israelites. And Pharaoh rejects his requests. And it becomes a matter of public opinion in Egypt. Pharaoh wants to kill him, but he does not want to kill him because it would basically wreak havoc. A lot of Egyptians are now siding with, with, with Moses and his, you know, extremely legitimate uh, cause. And so if Pharaoh takes his life, makes him into a martyr, it's the last thing he wants. So a tug of war, they keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, years. And Musa alayhi salam uses every trick in the book in order to convince Pharaoh to deliver the Israelites. And when all, everything failed, what does he do? He decides to take matters into his, his own hands and he gathers all the Israelites. Some people say it was close to a million. And they basically march towards Sinai. Everyone knows the story. It's in the Quran, it's in the Bible, right? They march towards Sinai, but in order to get to the Sinai, they have to cross a waterfront, perhaps the, the Suez a Gulf. So they come to the waterfront, and that is when all human imagination and all human plans and all human trickery just simply fail. We are now sandwiched. The army of Pharaoh is behind us, and the waterfront is in front of us. What can we do? Where can we go? So they say to Musa alayhi salam, we were suffering before you came and we continue to suffer after you came. Now what? What do we do now? You brought us here. Many of us kept telling you, let's not defy Pharaoh. Let's find a diplomatic solution. But here we are. What are we going to do now? And Musa alayhi salam understood the lesson. Yes, now we're hitting rock bottom. Yes, now we can expect the victory to come from God. When it becomes so bleak and so negative and so painful and extremely severe, that's when your heart should open up to the uh, blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is when God inspired Musa alayhi salam to take his staff and point the staff you know, at the sea. It's a beautiful story. But the same thing, relief comes at the tail end of severe tragedy. Again, this is your tweet for today. Relief from God only comes at the tail end of severe tragedy. We saw that in the story of the Prophet Remember? On their way to Medina, him and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. They are fugitives, they're running, you know, there's are bounty on them. And the people of Quraysh gather their best and strongest in order to pursue them. And people everywhere are just sniffing the very last smell of Muhammad and Abu Bakr. So they go and hide in a cave. And the people of Quraysh come all the way and they stand by the cave and they're literally hiding in the corner right there. If someone peeked with his head like this, they'll see them. And Abu Bakr is concerned for the Prophet's life. Ya Rasulullah, if any of them, Messenger of God, if any of them look down like this, they'll see us right away. And the Prophet ﷺ still taught him the same lesson that I am trying to teach you today. Yes, it is hitting rock bottom, it is bleak, it is very difficult. We're against the wall. But that is when you need to realize that God will interfere one way or another. I don't know how. Most of the time we don't. We don't have a computer to process God's, God's wisdom and predict his choices. But as men and women of faith, we just stay strong. And we let the creator manage the details. Because at the end of the day, when you think about it, you are but a leaf carried by the wind in this world. We try to convince ourselves and create the illusion that we are in control. Yes, you're in control of the breath you take, maybe for a while. You're in control of what type of food you consume, maybe for a brief period of time. You are in control of whether you can stand up right now or sit down and walk out of this place. Yes, there is an illusion of control. But ultimately, the Creator is, is in control of the bigger picture. He creates the frame in which you are able to move and navigate, right? 
And it was at that moment when the Prophet and Abu Bakr hit rock bottom and the tragedy is about to culminate, they did not look down. They did not speak into the cave. They looked away and walked away. And it was after that moment that the Muslim community was established in Medina. Right? We saw that after the, the battle of uh, Al-Ahzab, Al-Khandaq, you know, the trench. When uh, the, the, the Quraysh uh, surrounded 10,000 strong, they surrounded the city of Medina, put it under siege, laid siege to the city. They were bent on the complete and utter annihilation of the Muslims, extermination. It was going to be a genocide. And the Muslims, in an act of desperation, they dig the tunnel. And not the tunnel, they dig the trench. And that probably fends off uh, the enemy for you know, just some time, but they knew that you know, eventually they're going to breach. And some of the Muslims at the time, they, they, they would say, you know, we would not be able to leave our posts and even go to the restroom. We couldn't, right? And he was in that bleak moment when the Prophet ﷺ received the news that, uh, you know, his neighbors in the south of the city, they decided to uh, allow the Quraysh to breach from their side, right? Uh, the, the, the tribe of Banu Quraydah. They colluded with Quraysh and they were about to betray the Muslims and allow Quraysh to enter the city from, uh, from the south. It was in that moment when everything hit rock bottom that the Prophet ﷺ walks into his room and his heart is filled with sorrow and anguish and despair and he doesn't know what to do and he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the relief comes. Uh, a storm you know, comes and you know, basically destroys the camp of Quraysh, and they decided to pick up and leave with no atrocities, with no war whatsoever. But one of the most beautiful examples that I've personally seen, you know, just reading history, and again, I can stand here and give you example after example after examples of stories in history where victory and triumph and relief came at the tail end of severe tragedy. I can give you so many examples, but one of my favorite examples is that of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. If you remember, Salahuddin took back the city of Jerusalem, right, in 1187. Took back the, after 100 years of Jerusalem being, you know, occupied by the Crusades. When the Crusades came to Jerusalem, they laid waste to the city and they killed, you know, in the vicinity of about 80,000 Muslims and Jews. Right? Uh, even local Christians that did not follow, uh, you know, uh, the denominations of Christianity in Europe were slaughtered, you know, as well. And then for a hundred years, Jerusalem stayed with the Crusades. And then Salahuddin came in, 1187, and the city was liberated. And he gave safe passage to most of the Crusades. He did not, uh, uh, you know, again, exact his own vengeance against them, against them. He followed the prophetic teachings. But then the restoration of Jerusalem by the Muslims incited, uh, you know, a lot of Europeans and the Pope in Europe Right, to mobilize the Third Crusade, if you guys know the story. Uh, the, the Roman Emperor, who was also the German King, Frederick Barbarossa, uh, allied himself with the French King uh, and the, uh, you know, Richard the Lionheart, if you guys remember. And they mobilized this massive army of about 100,000 soldiers, including 20,000 knights. They swept through Europe. And then they came to Constantinople when it was when, with the Byzantines. And they convinced the, 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 the Byzantines to provide them with an additional 20,000 soldiers. Right? And they defeated the Turks in Anatolia. And they literally approached Jerusalem that they became a, 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 you know, a stone throw away from the holy city. And Salahuddin tried diplomacy, he tried a peace treaty, he tried a truce, he tried to, you know, uh, tried to, to, to organize another campaign somewhere else to get their attention. Nothing worked. And Salahuddin knew that he was going to be crushed. It's just too many soldiers. And his army was stretched out all over the place. So as every man or woman of faith is supposed to do, when things get really, really difficult, you're supposed to do what? Lose your faith and say, oh, you know, if this is happening to me, then God doesn't exist. Oh, well, there's another alternative, and that is to turn our faces to God and to pray sincerely like we mean it. And when all else failed, Salahuddin prayed. He fell on his knees and prayed and prayed and prayed in a remarkable story. And the relief came from God in the most unexpected form. Frederick Barbarossa is on his horse. 
He's wearing his armor, you know, galloping around with the utmost arrogance. He knew that he was going to bring the city of Jerusalem back to Europe. And then what happens to him? God subjected him to one of the most unexpected soldiers of the Creator, cold water. He fell off his horse into a tiny little pond and he drowned in cold water because his armor was too heavy. It took him down in literally uh, hip deep water. It wasn't even that deep. And they tried to preserve his body in vinegar so that they can still take him to Jerusalem in order to bury him over there and his body decomposed. So literally, his bones are buried somewhere, and his heart is buried somewhere, and the rest of his fl flesh is buried somewhere. And Salahuddin did not have to fight, and they did not have to worry about it, and the city of Jerusalem stayed with them. SubhanAllah. I, I keep giving you those examples. Why? Because you examine your own life, and you ask, you know, sometimes we allow tragedy to bring us to our knees and to break our backs, and to bog us down, and to push us to the brink of despair. But I'm telling you, sometimes a little bit of despair is good. Why? Because it pushes you to pray. It pushes you to pray. It pushes you to understand the fragility of life. It pushes you to understand that tragedy, by definition, brings people together. Reminds us of our common humanity. Reminds us of our shared values as a human race, right? And I say this again today, you know, for those of you who have not read the news, uh, we, we, we had a tremendous loss um, this morning. About 49, I think, or some, some say 50, of our brothers and sisters in New Zealand were um, heinously murdered in the mosque after Friday prayer. You know, literally, they were sitting just like you guys a few hours ago, listened to the khutbah, and after Friday prayer, some, you know, racist white supremacist walks into the masjid, and empties his ammunition in their backs, unarmed people. I, the first thing that I, it came to my mind when I spoke with my wife about this yesterday, how can anyone find any sense of victory or honor or, di or dignity when you go into a place of worship and you murder innocent people who couldn't even defend themselves? How does that make you feel good? How does that make you feel triumphant or powerful or strong? You know, if you fight people that can fight you back and you win, okay, I understand. Maybe this will make you feel strong. But when you fight people that cannot even fight you, that literally standing there, the brother is standing at the entrance of the masjid, and when he saw a non-Muslim approach, what's the first word that he said? He said, hello, brother. He said, hello, brother. And, you know, I don't advise you to see the video. I think YouTube and Facebook are trying to take it down right and left. But I made the mistake of watching the video, and it was absolutely horrific. He emptied his shotgun, you know, eight or nine shells in this brother at the entrance of the mosque, just when he told him, hello, brother, right? So today we mourn, and our hearts are filled with anguish, our hearts are filled with pain, but we also remember uh, that, again, victory, triumph, relief from the Creator, uh, they all come at the tail end of severe tragedy. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to accept us and to accept the martyrs, the shuhada in the highest level of Jannah. Brothers and sisters, raise your hand and speak to the Almighty from the heart. من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وقائد الغر الميامين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك رحم الرحمين اللهم آمين My dear brothers and sisters uh, Today is a day of mourning um, is a day of uh, tragedy and a day of sadness. Um, I, I'm sure that every single one of you heard the news, but um, in one of what is presumably one of the most peaceful places on earth, a place where um, all forms of violence, let alone gun violence, are actually extremely low, uh, the country of New Zealand, a white supremacist <coughs> walks into the masjid after Jummah and he mows down about 49 worshippers that are in no way or shape or form different from us. 
Um, and uh, it is very difficult to find purpose and to find wisdom in moments of tragedy. But as men and women of faith, we have to understand a few things that need to be clear, just like the light of day in our minds, okay? Number one, uh, tragedies are supposed to bring us closer to God and closer to each other. And we don't hurl, um, you know, racist things and make angry statements. So it's okay to be angry today. It's okay to be sorrowful and to suffer from some pain and sadness. That is natural. It's okay to yell and scream, you know, at home. But it is not okay to direct our anger towards people and groups and faiths and races. Uh, because the Quran is very clear about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us. لا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على ألا تعدلوا. Do not allow the injustices committed by others to cause you to act unjustly. So we don't do that. We will single out bad people with bad behavior and talk about that, right? And we don't say anything that displeases God on a day like this. You know, as the Prophet taught us when he lost his son Ibrahim, لا نقول إلا ما يرضي ربنا. We only say what pleases our Lord. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We all come from Allah and unto Allah we will all shall return one day. The other thing that, that as men and women of faith we need to understand today is that um, nothing happens in this world without Allah's decree. Nothing blindsides the Lord. Nothing happened as a surprise to Him, right? We don't understand the wisdom, but there is one, and that wisdom belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is it, and it's enough for us. And you need to know this. There is nothing, when it comes to life and death, there is nothing that one can do to avert the decree of the Creator. There's nothing. Because the time and the manner and the place of you parting ways with this world is already decreed in a book that, that belongs to Allah azza wa jal. Right? وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَى وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ you don't know what you will earn tomorrow and you don't know in which land you will leave this world, period. That too is another spiritual truth that we have to understand. Number three, I, I thought a lot about this you know, since yesterday night when I was following the news. It was very difficult to even fall asleep. But I thought about this a lot and I realized something. I've been to New Zealand, by the way, multiple times. I spoke at Masajid over there. SubhanAllah, for some reason, I, I, I went to almost every major city in New Zealand except Christchurch. I don't know if that's, that's a good thing or a bad thing. I wish I could tell you that I've been to that particular masjid. But I haven't been to Christchurch. I've been to other cities over there. And mashallah, the Muslim community is thriving and beautiful and large in New Zealand, right? But I realized something, and that is, when it, if you look at the map, and you have the time zones, the sun rises first, on New Zealand, which means that the day starts with New Zealand, which also means that the people that prayed Jum'ah over there are the first people to pray Jum'ah today on this earth, right? Because that was yesterday night their Jum'ah, right? Or, you know, maybe even evening. Yesterday evening was their Jum'ah, and then we follow them. The sun rises there first, Jum'ah was there first. That cohort of people that were killed at the masjid, they prayed Jum'ah before anybody else on this earth. Which also means that they died having prayed Jum'ah in the masjid, in a state of wudu. I can't think of a more honorable way to go, to be honest with you. I don't want to make light of a tragedy, right? We should still feel angry. But when I think of them and I think of where they are now, I am telling you, they are honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are in the hands of Allah as shuhada. Which tells me a lot about the Quran because, I mean, we live in an age where when the ayah says, وَيَتَّخِذَ مِنْكُمْ shuhada," That the Lord chooses who is martyred, right? And then we keep saying, oh, we live in this postmodern era. I mean, there's no, nobody fights for a good cause anymore. I mean, even if you're in the U.S. military, you don't know what you're fighting for. There's a corrupt politician that pushes a button and tells you go here and go there. You don't know what you're fighting for, right? So how can we fight a battle in which we feel that we are fighting for a good cause and when you die, you become a martyr? Those who die with ISIS are not martyrs either. Those who die with Al-Qaeda are not martyrs either. They're all corrupt, right? They're terrorists. No different from this guy, right? 
So sometimes you ask yourself, you know, where can I fight a battle that would be honorable, that would be loved and accepted by everyone, and, you know, something that would be loved by God, and then I die as a shaheed. And then you look at an incident like this, and like, subhanAllah, of all places on earth, the most unexpected for a tragedy like this to happen, and God selects 49 people, and he says, those will become shuhada. In the reflection of the ayah, وَيَتَّخِذَ مِنْكُمْ shuhada. They were selected by Allah Azza wa And here's what I wanted to tell you today in conclusion, right? Because, you know, in, in moments like this, you know, a lot of people get scared and get frightened, which is okay, it's absolutely normal, but you should not change your behavior, right? I don't want to see anyone say, oh, we need, we need to stop coming to the masjid, or we need to take a break, or, you know, let's take off our hijabs, or, you know, all this stuff. You know, then, then you are literally doing the bidding of this terrorist. You're doing what they want to see, right? The best response is to be who you are, Wake up every morning with your head high, with a feeling of honor and dignity and pride of who you are as a Muslim and as a human being. And you go to work and you go to the masjid and you go to the mall and you profess your Muslim identity everywhere you go. That's the best response. That is the best response, right? It's to be at the forefront. It's to use this uh, tragedy as a conversation starter, right? And that's what I said to you earlier in the khutbah, right? There is always a relief and a triumph that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the tail end of a tragedy. So I pray to Allah azza wa jal today. I pray that this tragedy and, and the severe price that our brothers and sisters had to pay will become a watershed moment in the world where people realize that the greatest threat for peace, the greatest threat for security, and the greatest threat for the world is not ISIS and Al-Qaeda, it is white supremacy. I pray that people will realize that. That it is white supremacy that is our greatest threat. Let me ask you a question in conclusion. What is the dua that we say when we experience a tragedy or a loss of life? That I said earlier. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un. Right? We belong to Allah and unto Allah we shall return. Okay? What is the context of that ayah in the Quran? Let me remind you. Look at what Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, "Wala taqulu liman yuqtalu fi sabilillahi amwat bal ahya' walakin la tash'urun." Don't say that those who die for the cause of God are act are actually dead. Rather, they are alive. You just don't feel them or feel their presence. And then Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, "Wala nabluwannakum" بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين. I will test you. I will subject you to severe trials of loss of life, of loss of wealth, of loss of the children, of loss of money, of loss of you know the fruit of your own labor. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Give my glad tidings to those who are patient, those those who persevere." Right. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Those who, when are afflicted by a calamity, they say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ To Allah we belong and from Allah we will, to Allah we, we shall return. And the thing is, it's fascinating to me that this ayah is mentioned in the context of shahada. In the context of someone dying as a shaheed. SubhanAllah. This is what incites the Qur'an to tell you the dua is when, when God talks about someone who died, you know, like our oh, brothers and sisters died in, uh, in New Zealand. <coughs> Today, and let me end with this, uh, I was planning to take a small group of brothers, very, very small group, four or five, to explore a property that we are considering for Terbi. There's about seven or eight minutes from here, right? 40 plus thousand square feet. This is a massive facility. And this would be like, you know, again, we haven't made any decisions yet. We're still looking at, uh, you know, all the different factors and the finances and everything. But I was just planning, it was scheduled from a few days ago. I was planning to take a few brothers to just go there, kind of get the opinion of small groups of people at a time, right? I had no plans whatsoever to announce this today. But I felt that the best response we can give to people who would like to see Muslims hide and cower 
who would like to see Muslims scared and frightened, the best response is to show them how our community is looking at the future and looking to grow and looking to expand and looking to send roots in the ground and looking to establish itself. And I am compelled and propelled by what happened to do more and to exert more effort so that inshallah ta'ala our community has its own massive facility in the very near future with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the best response we can, we can show them and give them is when we put our hearts and our minds and our resources together and send an unequivocal message to everyone that Muslims are here and they are here to stay and forever. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins, to establish us firmly on his path. I ask Allah to bring us closer to each other as brothers and sisters. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us offer comfort and solace to each other. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us find wisdom and meaning and purpose in these difficult times. I ask Allah on this day to bring solace and comfort to the hearts of those who lost loved ones in the events and the terrorist attacks of New Zealand. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the shuhada in the highest level of Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant each and every one of us an honorable way to leave this world when our time comes. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen this community, to establish this community on the foundations of justice and piety and love and strength and compassion. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He gathered us here in the shape and form to gather all of us in the highest level of Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma laka alhamdu kama inbaghi li jalali wajhika wa azimi sultanik. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kabira. Taqabbal minna inna ka anta al-sameeul alim. Wa tub alayna inna ka anta al-tawab al-rahim. Allahumma arham shuhada al-muslimin. Allahumma arham shuhada al-muslimin. اللهم ارحم شهداء المسلمين اللهم كن للأطفال واليتامى والثكالى برحمتك أرحم الراحمين اللهم كن معهم وخفف عنهم واربط على قلوبهم وثبت الأرض من تحت أقدامهم اللهم يا ربنا آجرنا في مصيبتنا واخلف لنا خيرا منها إنا لك وإنا إليك راجعون اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات مسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب دعوة يا رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتاب موقوتا